Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Wow, what a great turnout. Thank you. Uh, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> uh, it is uh, it's an exciting time to be alive. Uh, it's an exciting time to be an American because I think we are this close to taking our country back. Let's, let's not make any mistake about the stakes in this next election. This election, unlike any other presidential election in which I have been involved, uh, is not Republicans versus Democrats. It's the insiders versus the outsiders. It is the political establishment of both parties combined with the mainstream elitist corporate controlled media that have given us Republicans under Republicans and Democrats 30 years of failed policies which have brought the country to where it is today so what have the Clintons and the Bushes brought us endless war erosion of our civil liberties massive debt and spending while we give lip service to cutting federal spending bailouts for the crooks and swindlers on Wall Street while average people can't find a job and while veterans can't get adequate medical attention and a foreign policy that is entirely incoherent. It appears that what we have done under the Obama-Clinton administration at the State Department is to borrow the money to systematically topple our allies and insert our worst enemies, AKA the Muslim Brotherhood, in control of virtually every country within the Middle East. How does this make sense? Arab Spring, my ass. <laughs> Hillary Clinton says that she's an advocate for women. Ask the women of Libya how that works out. Because under Gaddafi, in a relatively cosmopolitan society, women could be educated, go to college, go to postgrad, own property, drive a car, go out in public without a veil, and if a woman was raped, her rapist was prosecuted and punished. Today, under Sharia law, none of those things are possible. That is what Hillary Clinton has done for the women of, of, uh, of Libya. So it is, uh, it is uh, a point in which I must say as a veteran of nine Republican presidential campaigns, with someone who has a great sentimental attachment to the party of Lincoln, to the party of Theodore Roosevelt, to the party of Barry Goldwater, to the party of Dwight Eisenhower and Richard Nixon, that Republican party has had been hijacked. That Republican party had become the party of Wall Street and the party of K Street uh, and the party, as I indicated, of globalist policies that have not served the United States well. Under Donald Trump, welcome to the new Republican Party. <laughs> this election is not only insiders versus outsiders, but it is the globalists and those who favor the new world order against the nationalists, those who believe in American sovereignty, who believe in American strength, who believe in American power, who believe in the American system of free enterprise. That is the choice. The globalist policies, particularly in the area of trade, have destroyed the job market in this country. Who gave us NAFTA? Bill Clinton with his cheerleader wife, Hillary. Of course, now she says it was a mistake. Yeah. Why are so many young African Americans incarcerated in this country, costing us a fortune, rehabilitating no one, turning them into hardened criminals, 
for nonviolent crimes such as the possession of small amounts of drugs. Whose fault is this? Bill Clinton and his racist 1994 crime bill, a proposal which Hillary said was necessary because black people were super predators who must be made to heal. Who are the racists? They, they are the racists. There's only one candidate for President of the United States who once attended a Halloween party in blackface, and that's Hillary Clinton. What about how did black people fare under the Clinton years? In fact, how did they do under both the Clintons and the Obamas? Unemployment in the African American community is so bad that they have to deduct those people who are no longer looking for work from the statistics, dress them up to make them look better than they are, and they're still terrible. So, in Donald Trump, I believe we have a candidate who is beholden to no special interest, who cannot be bought, cannot be bullied, is not in the thrall of the globalists and the New York, Washington media elites, who has no connection to the failed thinking of the past, to the failed policies of the past, who said at the time, NAFTA was a mistake, who said at the time, the Iraq war was a mistake. This is a break with the two-party duopoly that have brought this country to its knees. Now, he's not a polished political performer. He never claimed to be one. There's a big difference between being a real estate developer or even being a, 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 a celebrity and a candidate for public office. So he is not politically correct. But I do think he speaks the common people's language. And the people are more angry and more upset and more disillusioned than at any time in which I have been involved in American politics. And that takes you back to 1964, when I attended the Republican National Convention at age 12. <laughs> the Clintons have lived a charmed life. The greatest reason for that is because in the Clintons' heyday, the 80s, there were only three television networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. There were a handful of national newspapers, and if you could either charm or mau mau those news outlets into not covering a story, yeah. it's like it never happened. So let's take, uh, for example, Juanita Broderick. Juanita Broderick was an Arkansas State employee. Pardon me, incorrect. She worked. In, she owned a nursing home, which was licensed by the state of Arkansas. She met Bill Clinton at a conference. He raped her twice and bit her. NBC had a chilling interview with her, thanks to the courageous journalist Lisa Myers, and it sat there in the can for one year before they ultimately aired it. We now know, because she has said it in a recent interview, that in the interview, when she began talking about not only Bill Clinton's assault on her, her his sexual assault on her, when she began talking about Hillary's role in intimidating her after the assault, a producer from NBC jumped up and yelled, cut, we don't want to go there. Well, folks, it's time for us to go there. Yeah. Because Hillary Clinton is not an advocate for women. She is an abuser of women. And Bill Clinton is a serial sexual predator. This isn't about marital infidelity or adultery or girlfriends or mistresses or one night stands. The truth is Bill Clinton has probably been with thousands of women on a consensual basis. What I'm talking about, what the Clinton's War on Women, my book is talking about, is something much darker, sexual assault. 
rape, violence against women. And the fact is, Hillary Clinton is an accessory after the fact in every one of those sex crimes because it is Hillary who directs the effort to discredit these women, to dig up dirt on these women, to intimidate these women, to threaten these women, to bully these women. It's Hillary Clinton who hires the nasty lawyers and the heavy-handed private detectives who threaten these women, who stalk them, who follow them, who break into their homes, threaten their children, kill their pets, vandalize their cars, and menace them. Imagine your life if somebody followed you constantly in a black car and then they would come close enough for you to hear and they would say, you're in danger. Those are the tactics of Hillary Clinton. How do we know this? One private detective, Jack Palladino, was chatting up a beautiful blonde in a bar in LA bragging about what he had done to Kathleen Willey at the behest of Hillary Clinton. And then he learned that the woman he was chatting up was a reporter. <laughs> of course, today he denies it, but he's lying. Lying is a fundamental thing to understand about the Clintons. Hillary is actually congenitally incapable of telling the truth. <laughs> she lies about being under sniper fire in Bosnia. She lies about the Rose Law Firm billing records in Whitewater going missing and then suddenly turning up. She lies about being broke when she leaves the White House. She lies about stealing the china and the silver and the furniture when she left the White House. She lies about her grandparents being immigrants. She lies about being named after Sir Edmund Hillary. She lies about her email account. She lies about the misuse of classified documents, which destroyed the career of General David Petraeus, who did far less. Nothing that comes out of this woman's mouth is the truth. But here's what you can bet. Everything that does come out of her mouth has been polled and focus grouped and roundtabled and discussed. And that's why it sounds so stale and phony. Donald Trump, on the other hand, is uncoached, unprogrammed, unscripted, and uncontrolled. That's what makes him so interesting. That's why uh, the ratings tell the story. So you are going to have debates here that I think will be pivotal in this race. I would be the first to admit uh, that Trump has not had a good 10 days. And it is incumbent on us to at least quickly review the entire affair regarding Captain Khan, uh, who gave his life in the service of his country. Now, on the one hand, I certainly honor his service and I honor and respect that sacrifice. But Mr. Khan should not be allowed to use his dead son as a shield to hide the fact that although he waves a copy of the Constitution, he has written and spoken in support of Sharia law, including the fact that Sharia should take precedence over all man-made laws, including said Constitution. So who is it who hasn't read the Constitution? And while we're at it, Donald Trump's proposal to temporarily ban Muslim immigration until we can set up a system that vets those who wish to come here. And by the way, here's a big old start. We should be allowed to look at the social media postings of people who apply to come here. Today, the U.S. immigration system is prohibited from doing so. Folks, if they're saying Ali Akbar and calling for the death of Jews, I don't want them in this country. But to say that Trump's proposal is unconstitutional shows that Mr. Khan is, for a lawyer, ignorant of the law. By the way, he practiced at a big Democratic law firm where Loretta Lynch, among others, practiced law. 
We also now know that Mr. Khan got $379,000 from the Clinton Foundation. So he is what you call a ringer, and this is called a con job. <laughs> And, and before uh, someone in the mainstream media or someone uh, at one of the Clinton front groups seeks to twist what I said, let me repeat again. I honor his son's service to his country. His, his son's death is a great tragedy. It, it is particularly tragic that he died in a war that Hillary Clinton supported and Donald Trump did not. So my book, The Clinton's War on Women, is on more than just Bill's role as a sexual predator uh, and Hillary's role in covering up those crimes. Although to prosecute Bill Cosby and not prosecute Bill Clinton seems to me to be racist. Uh, the difference between Cosby and Clinton is that Cosby preferred to drug his victims, whereas Bill preferred to physically overpower and bite his. Three of the women victims uh, uh, that I identify and confirmed by the Washington Post and NBC, Bill's MO was to bite through the upper lip of his victims. It's a disabling move. If you go online and do a little research, it's a classic disabling move for rapists because a woman stops trying to cover her genitals and starts to deal with the blood gushing out of her lip. It's also a not so subtle way of saying keep your mouth shut. That's Bill Clinton. Now, the disparity, disp uh, disparity between Clinton uh, and Cosby is so shocking. If Jesse Jackson were here, he would say, the white man campaigns while the black man is arraigned. And that kind of sums it up. Why don't we have one standard of justice? Why is Congresswoman Corrine Brown, who got caught in a $5 million nonprofit financial scheme, she is facing 357 possible years in jail while the Clinton Foundation is the largest single money laundering fraud in American criminal history. A $5 billion Ponzi scheme, a phony, a fugazi. Their federal and state filings are permeated with fraud. They use the, the uh, Clinton Foundation as a slush fund to pay for uh, all kinds of inappropriate things, but to keep a phalanx of flunkies on the payroll, to pay for their lavish lifestyle, but helping people, not so much. The millions of dollars of AIDS drugs that they say they have distributed in Africa, those drugs have never been approved by the FDA or anyone. They may be doing more harm than good. This is a scam, and it will be the Clinton's downfall. Here's why. They have argued, for example, well, yes, we did take millions of dollars from interests in Russia who sought to get control of a large percentage of American uranium, and we did help make that happen, but you can't prove that those things are connected. You have no proof. Well, maybe Julian Assange has that. You see, the Clinton emails are like Richard Nixon and the Watergate tapes. They're indelible, and they're all coming back to bite the Clintons in the ass. Because what you're going to have in writing is stone cold proof of the criminality of Bill, Hillary, and Chelsea Clinton. Now, some people say to me, why are you picking on a little girl? 
<laughs> she's a 30 year old adult. Like her mother, she is abusive, foul mouthed, greedy, short tempered, and impossible to work with. Now, Chelsea says she tried to care about money, but she just couldn't. You know, if I lived in a $10.5 million condominium, I probably wouldn't care about money either. If I were being paid $6 million a year to manage the money laundering operation that is the Clinton Foundation, I probably wouldn't care about money either. If my wedding cost $3.5 million, how many people could you feed for that? I probably wouldn't care about money either. But because Chelsea is an officer of the Clinton Foundation, she is the one legally responsible for the corruption there. So, don't feel sorry for lovely Chelsea. Uh, this uh, book, uh, The Clinton's War on Women, uh, makes some strong claims. Uh, but the most fundamental frame of it, Hillary's use of the lawyers and private detectives to harass and intimidate Bill Clinton's sexual assault victims, comes from a book I highly commend to you. It's called The Seduction of Hillary Rodham by David Brock. Mr. Brock, who's now gone to the dark side, has never disavowed this book. That's because everything in it is true. Now, if you uh, want to know about the Clinton's financial shenanigans, I strongly recommend Peter Schweitzer's book, uh, Clinton Cash, yeah. with the caveat that that book ends at the time it went to publication, and so much more is known now about the Clinton's finances, about the way they have lined their pockets with enormous speaking fees, those are really bribes that they describe that, that they disguise as a honorarium. Six hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars to Hillary Clinton for a speech to Goldman Sachs that she refuses to release. What could she possibly have said? The idea that she is going to tame or reform Wall Street is a joke. She is owned by Wall Street. Bernie Sanders got it. Donald Trump gets it. I mean, the, the entire notion, and I've been excoriated in a couple editorials recently because I said that I feared that this election would be stolen. Now, the liberals jump up and down and they say, voter fraud does not exist. <laughs> well, in all fairness, voter fraud is, it exists, but it is somewhat limited. I'm talking not about voter fraud, I'm talking about election theft. I'm talking about rigging the computerized machines, which is easily done, which has been done to Bernie Sanders, it appears, in Kentucky and Wisconsin and New York and probably other places. A computerized voting machine is merely a computer. Don't tell me it can't be programmed for a predetermined outcome. Of course it can. Do you think that the Diebold, they changed their name because they were so so disreputable, they now call themselves a, a premier election solutions. How's that for generic? Do you gonna tell me that, the, that these machines under the control of the mayor of Chicago are not going to be rigged for Hillary Clinton? Please. In fact, President Obama said the other day that fears about the last, next election being stolen are, and I quote, ridiculous. Now, I'm positive they're going to do it. <laughs> Rigging elections is not, I'm sorry to say, the province of one party or the other. Sadly, I think both parties have engaged in this. How? The party in power controls the machines on a state basis. The Secretary of State, Alex Padilla, has custody of all the voting machines in that state. I tried to reach him, but he was out campaigning for Hillary Clinton. Oh my God. Now remember when uh, 
Do you remember when uh, Catherine Harris was the Secretary of State and the Democrats objected because she was in charge of the recount, but she was also campaigning for George W. Bush? Why is nobody screaming about Mr. Padilla, who is the custodian of these machines? So uh, the party in power will use the access to the machines. Now, Donald Trump is extremely aware of this, and he's already, in essence, put the Clintons on notice that if there is any evidence of, of uh, fraud or inappropriate uh, rigging of these machines, he's going to contest this election. I've known him 40 years. He is neither a quitter, nor is he a brawler. Uh, and he is a brawler. Uh, and he is a fighter. There is zero chance that he throws in the towels, the towel. So the other thing that happened, other than the con job, as I like to call it, uh, and to be clear, uh, the initial stories that associated Mr. Khan with the Muslim Brotherhood were incorrect. He has merely praised them. He is not a member. He's not Egyptian. He's a Saudi. He is directly traceable to the World Muslim League. He is directly traceable to the uh, a journal the, uh, on Muslim minority affairs where Huma Abedin used to work. Uh, and he, both of these are funded by uh, Sheikh Omar Abdul Nasif, who was identified as having financed the attack on America on 9-11. This is Mr. Khan's lineage. Uh, the other thing that happened, of course, was this entire flap about whether Donald Trump would endorse Paul Ryan. Now, Mr. Ryan did not endorse Donald Trump until Donald Trump was the nominee of the party, and even then, he waited a while. Mr. Ryan is not yet the nominee of the Republican Party. Either is John McCain. Either is Senator Kelly Ayotte. So, like Ronald Reagan, it's Trump's policy to stay out of primaries. So, why did everybody in the Beltway flip out when he said he wasn't going to endorse Ryan? Now, he solved that problem by endorsing Ryan. Not that I think it matters one way or another. But the Democratic process would have argued to wait until after the primary. So what happens then is some Republicans, some Republicans at the Republican National Committee, some Republicans whose names rhyme with Reince Priebus, <laughs> leak a story that Trump is thinking about getting out. He's going to drop, and here's the process to fill the seat. Folks, Donald Trump did not think for one second about getting out of this race. ABC, New York Times, that is a vile lie spread by Republicans still angry about the hostile takeover of their party. It is followed by lie number two. There's a staff revolt. Trump's entire campaign is walking out on him. False. Paul Manafort, his campaign chairman, is resigning. False. Paul Manafort is given up and he's mailing it in. Believe me, folks, Manafort is Sicilian. He's never mailing it in. <laughs> so uh, I have not seen this kind of uh, mainstream media distortion. Some of the older folks remember this since the campaign of Barry Goldwater. Remember that? Mm -hmm. He's nuts. He's trigger happy. He's crazy. He's going to start a nuclear war. Poor guy takes his wife to Germany for a quick vacation just before the Republican National Convention. CBS reports that he's in Germany meeting with neo-Nazi elements. A lie by Daniel Shore. A disgraceful lie. That's the kind of smear we're looking at. They've already telegraphed it. They're going to try to tell us that Trump is a bigot and a racist and a misogynist. I've known him 40 years, 39. He is none of those things. He's an independent thinker. He is a man of courage. He has put his money where his mouth is. He has spent $40 million of his own money running for president. And as I said earlier, nobody owns him.
We also learned this week that the polls are being rigged. That the Reuters poll purposely oversampled Democrats to show Hillary further ahead. Now, when I was in Cleveland, I had dinner with Nigel Farage, who is the head of the Brexit campaign in the UK, the strike against globalism that those patriots carried out. And he told me it's interesting, in their election, the polls were also rigged to show that the anti-Brexit side had a much bigger vote in order to dispirit and discourage Brexit supporters and Brexit campaign donors. So this attempt to show Trump, who by the way, could be two points behind, could be two points ahead. I expect this race to remain very close. I think that there will be times when Trump will pull ahead. I think there will be times when Hillary pulls ahead. Neither one of them will ever be out of range of the other. Because the country is so closely divided, because they are going to vote a substantial number of illegals, uh, and because the mainstream media is constantly showering crap on Trump, whereas the IRS in, uh, announces an investigation into the Clinton Foundation on the Monday of the Democratic National Convention. Find it in the New York Times. Find it in AP. Find it in the Wall Street Journal. Find it on CNN. It's not there. We find out that Hillary Clinton lied about arming ISIS selling them or giving them weapons and Apache helicopters wasn't on the front page of any newspaper that I saw. So despite the mainstream media bias, despite the, uh, the uh, effort to rig the polls, Trump remains in a competitive position. Two things I think, three things are going to be determinative. The debates, in which the only thing predictable about Donald Trump is that he's entirely unpredictable. Yeah. <laughs> and where he's going to come at her, she's not gonna know until it happens. Yeah. Right. The fact that WikiLeaks has promised us tranches more of Clinton emails, and as they demonstrated at the Democratic Convention, their sense of timing is excellent. <laughs> Whoever's doing this is a skillful strategist. Uh, and those events are going to affect this race. And then there is the horrific and imponderable. Another Orlando. Another Paris. Another Dallas or another Baton Rouge. Police killings or terrorist attacks can change this race. So anybody who is a Trump supporter who was concerned that a week ago he was nine points behind in a national poll. Take this to heart. First of all, it's probably only four. And he's closed the gap since then. So don't be disheartened. Do not be dispirited. This election is going to be skin tight. I am working with uh, a group called uh, the Committee to Restore America's Greatness we have a project called Stop the Steal. And here's how it works, it's really simple. The greatest single hedge against them rigging the elections through the machines is to register one million new Trump voters in the 11 key states that are going to decide this election. And for the first time in Trump, we actually have a candidate who attracts new voters to be registered. The reason that Mitt Romney never had a successful voter registration drive is nobody wanted to join the Republican Party of Mitt Romney. 375,000 more people voted for Donald Trump in the Florida primary than voted for Mitt Romney. And if you go back and look at who those people are, half of them are new voters. The other half are people who didn't vote four years ago or six years ago people coming back to the process. So uh, the greatest single hedge, again, against either voter fraud or more precise, precisely election theft, uh, is to register a million new voters using a sophisticated 
uh, analytical program. We know how to find those people. We know how to register them. That is a, a project you can go to RestoreAmericasGreatness.org, uh, and I think you will shortly be able to go to StopTheSteal.com, uh, and you can see uh, our entire plan there laid out. Uh, send us a small contribution if you can. Send us an evil, even larger contribution if you can. Uh, but this important work is the best way to fight what I know is coming. Uh, at that juncture, I will leave you with one final thought. Uh, I urge you to get a copy of the Clinton's War on Women. It is the definitive expose of Bill, Hillary, and Chelsea. And when you have finished reading it, pass it on to a woman. Pass it on to a woman who is either thinking of voting for Hillary or undecided. Because when you read this book, you will find out that Bill and Hillary Clinton are the penicillin-resistant syphilis of the American body politic. I would be happy to take a, a few questions on any topic of your choosing. Yes, sir, with the red hat. Before we go into that, can you yes. talk a little bit about your other book, Jeff? Yes. And uh, also yes. the interest in Common Core. Why is it that it's <clears throat> so... Uh, I have uh, I've also written a book uh, that was uh, entitled Jeb and the Bush Crime Family. And 11 days after the book came out, Jeb dropped out of the race. Cause, effect. Uh, my book is a no holds barred expose of how Jeb became very, very, very rich on being governor of Florida move the state pension fund management to Lehman Brothers, leave office, get a $5 million bonus from Lehman Brothers. Uh, track phones, you know, Obama phones that you're familiar with, the government gives out thousands and thousands of cell phones to poor people. That project actually began under George W. Bush. The company that has the contract, tra uh, track phones, uh, is owned by Carlos Slim, the Mexican billionaire who owns the New York Times, and his secret silent partner, Jeb Bush. Now, Jeb transferred the stock to one of his sons so he wouldn't have to disclose it when he ran for president. Obamacare, Jeb's made millions through Obamacare, through uh, Tenley Healthcare. Or then there's Common Core. His brother owns the patent on the books that would be used under Common Core. You see, the Clintons, pardon me, the Bushes are not conservatives. They have never been conservatives. They are crony capitalists who have made millions for themselves and their friends, while their policies have made regular people much poorer. And that's my objection. In any event, the book will be out next year in paperback, with the new title, The Bush Crime Family. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. I want to I want to uh, salute you for your courage in not only confronting but exposing the evil of the Bush family and the Clinton family. You also have an exhaustive you have an exhaustive schedule of being a Trump surrogate, unofficial. I mean, your your schedule is amazing. That of an Iron Man competition. I want to salute you for that. Thank you. Also, you're a avid and fastidious historian, and you've written a book on LBJ, the man who killed Kennedy. It's a good book. And um, on the eve of uh, Richard Nixon's 40, 42nd anniversary of his re resignation tomorrow, I want to ask you a question on the Kennedy assassination. Sure. Uh, as you have written in your book, LBJ's hitman, Mac Wallace, was the trigger man at the uh, the book, the Texas Book Depository. Correct. Uh, who is the person, in your view, who killed Officer J.D. Tippett, who you say was on his way to kill the patsy Lee Harvey Oswald? Well, let's start with what we do know. It's definitely not Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, first of all, the uh, the expended shells on the ground where Tippett is killed 
come from an automatic. Oswald is arrested in the theater with a revolver. Secondarily, from a time point of view, it's not possible for Oswald to have gotten to his rooming house where a Dallas police car pulls out in front and toots the horn and then drives away, curious, uh, get his jacket and his gun, uh, and then kill Tippett. There are three witnesses to the Tippett murder. Three of them say the man was heavy set and did not look like Lee Harvey Oswald. One woman, 89, who admits to bad eyesight, she fingered Oswald. Guess which one the Warren Commission chose to publish in its report. So it's unclear whether Ruby is, was uh, involved in Tippett's murder. It is unclear who killed Tippett. It's easier to say who did not kill him. However, it's important to know that of the four known witnesses, three of them report two men involved in the killing. Just another hole in the Warren Commission report. At this point, whether you buy my thesis, in which I use fingerprint evidence and eyewitness evidence and a lot of missing details about deep Texas politics to make the case that Lyndon Johnson was the one with the motive, means, and opportunity. Uh, a a uh, fingerprint is found for a man named Malcolm Wallace who has a patronage job at the Agriculture Department arranged for by Lyndon Johnson, who has a record for murder uh, of uh, a man who was involved in a triangle with Lyndon Johnson's sister in 1951. <laughs> That's why we have his fingerprints on file. But whether you believe that or not, it is indisputable that it is impossible for Oswald to shoot Kennedy using an unsighted a, a rifle in which the sighting is off, getting off three shots that the government has never been able to match with their best marksmen, hide the rifle, run down four flights of stairs to be seen on the second floor by a Dallas police officer exactly seven minutes after the first shot. Not possible. The electricity is not only off in the building, but there is a woman who was identified and found by the Warren Commission, whose testimony is not included in their report, who is on the staircase between floors six and two, a wooden staircase, and she neither sees nor hears Lee Harvey Oswald. He isn't even on the sixth floor, which is, by the way, when he's pulled out in public, very extraordinary, what does he shout? I didn't shoot anybody, he says. I'm a patsy. And indeed, he was. Anyway, uh, if you haven't read this book, I commend it to you. It's called The Man Who Killed Kennedy, The Case Against LBJ. You can get it at Amazon. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. You can go to rogerstone.com and get it. You can go to stonecoldtruth.com and get it. Uh, it reads like a murder mystery. If you read this book and you are not convinced, I'll be surprised. Uh, uh, it is uh, interesting that exactly two minutes after Kennedy has been shot, Malcolm Kilduff, who is Kennedy's deputy press secretary, says to Vice President, soon to be President Johnson, who do you think killed the president? And Johnson says, it was a communist. And Kilduff said, what kind of communist? And Johnson said, a Russian communist. Really? They hadn't even arrested Oswald yet and identified him. How did Johnson know? Why, in the footage of Johnson's limousine as it pulls into Dealey Plaza just before the first shot rings out, you know where LBJ can be found? On the floor of his limousine. It's in, uh, it's in the U.S. Senator uh, uh, U.S. Senator's memoirs, it is captured in both film and photograph. Johnson hits the deck and he's holding a small radio to his ear, presumably a walkie-talkie. We also learn that he instructs the Secret Service agent assigned to him, Rufus Youngblood, to lie to the Warren Commission and say that he pushed Johnson to the floor after the first shot. Youngblood, after Johnson's death, admits that that was a lie, that he was instructed 
to give to the Warren Commission. Anyway, enough enough of the Kennedy assassination. David could be here all night. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Stone, you obviously obviously have a very clear understanding of the dangers of America facing from potentially uncontrolled Muslim immigration. Yes. So I'm wondering two things. I'm wondering whether you know that here in this county we have a brother sheriff's deputy who's a senior official yes. of, of a terrorist organization. Yes. I believe he joined the uh, the BSO under the previous Republican That's chair. actually not true. It is That's most true. definitely true. I have a copy. Okay. I have a copy. No, I have a copy. I have a copy. You're incorrect. Ask your question. Uh, well, in the copy of the application I have, it shows that he was sponsored by Scott Israel. That's not true. Okay. Then, then the copy that it's not the true. sheriff's department gave me is falsified. It's, it's not true. But he, but uh, he was not a deputy. He was not hired as a deputy under the previous sheriff. Pardon me, the previous corrupt sheriff, the one who erased records before he left on the Rothstein case. That sheriff. You see, I don't think law enforcement is partisan. Actually, I think the sheriff should be a nonpartisan uh, position. Now, I don't agree with with uh, care. But I know that if you fired that man, the courts would reinstate him tomorrow. Even though the United States Constitution in two sections clarifies why his employment is... Why do you think the Constitution matters in front of our courts? Okay. <laughs> Next question. Well, uh, with regard to the October surprise, what would be your forecast on that, given what Julian Assange has intimated he's going to do well it could be any number of things i actually have uh communicated with assange uh i believe the next tranche of his documents pertain to the clinton foundation but there's no telling what the october surprise may be you can bet that the democrats plan one again there is a lawsuit uh filed by jane doe supported by tiffany doe accusing Trump falsely of raping a 13-year-old. Now, if you won't put your name on it, don't ask us to believe you. This, this same phony lawsuit was thrown out by a judge in California, has been refiled. Uh, the lawyer in question is not some with, someone with an expertise in sexual assault issues. Uh, the allegation is that Jeffrey Epstein, the billionaire uh, hedge fund manager whose antics raping 33 underage girls in Palm Beach County, the youngest 13, the oldest 17, uh, a friend of Bill's, a donor to the Clinton Foundation, somebody whose hedonistic private island Bill Clinton visited on numerous occasions for parties, uh, that uh, it is true that Epstein was a member of Trump's club in Palm Beach, but there is no evidence in this long drawn out case, and I've read the entire transcript, that Trump ever acted inappropriately with any underage girl, nor would he. So it's, it's a smear. Perhaps it is a, uh, an attempt to tell Trump that if he tries to raise Bill's involvement with underage girls, that they're going to smear Trump. But if this is their October surprise, it's a dud. Because I've known Trump 40 years. Uh, this is just not something he would do. And the, uh, the accusations being made against him are being made by people who insist on remaining anonymous. How can we believe that they're credible? Any other questions? Yes. Okay, go ahead, Mary. What's your opinion about the alt right movement? About alt right, alt conservatives. Well, I think that uh, that until around 1964, uh, that many uh, on the right had associations that were racist, that were anti-Semitic, uh, that were destructive. I consider myself a Goldwater conservative, therefore a Reagan conservative. 
I want to see America grow. I want to see all people prosper. Uh, I am opposed to bigotry. I am opposed uh, to racism. I am a strong supporter of the state of Israel because it's the only reliable democracy in the region. Uh, and I think the new right uh, is more associated with an optimistic, uplifting, pro-growth brand of conservatism in which the economic issues are what bind me, because I'm a libertarian and I'm not a social conservative, but I respect social conservatives, and we have in common a belief in American nationalism, low taxes, reasonable spending, less regulation. So economic issues, I think, are the glue that hold us all together under the rubric of conservatives. With the election of Reagan, the conservative movement grew to now we are like the left in that we have different branches. There are libertarian conservatives, there are fiscal conservatives, there are foreign policy and defense conservatives. That is the price of success, not failure. Another question. I'll ask the uh, last yeah. question, All right. uh, Mr. Stone. So we are banking so heavily on the debates. Now, you remember Rick Lazio? Yes. So given the unpredictability <laughs> of Mr. Trump, do you fear that she's very, very clever? Well, there is no question that uh, attacking a woman has to be done in a certain way. On the other hand, I don't think Trump will start it. I think he'll finish it. <laughs> I expect that she'll show her claws first, and I think that gives him the license. So if she says, for example, you know, uh, you're a misogynist, you call women you don't like fat pigs. Donald will say, Hillary, your husband's a serial rapist, but what you did to those women is even worse, because you violated them psychologically. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it can be done. <laughs> there is nothing warm or likable about Hillary Clinton, nothing whatsoever. She is, uh, as I think uh, this uh, Secret Service agent Brady, I believe, an excellent book, yeah. has written. She has dual personalities. You see uh, the public, her, you know, trying to be the kindly grandmother, but privately, she is a short-tempered, foul-mouthed, abusive, greedy, megalomaniac, famous for abusing staff. We've actually uncovered a memo to the staff in the Clinton White House telling them, if you encounter the First Lady in the hallways, you are instructed not to look at her, to look down, and do not address her. What kind of leader is that? Yes, sir. Newsmax is reporting, and I quote, that there's an anti-Trump gop -er launching a bid. Do you know anything about this? I can give you his name in a moment. His name is McAuliffe or McMulfin or something like that. Do you know anything about that? Not today. I don't, but I'm not sure how you would do that. Getting on the ballot in 50 states is, at this junk, late juncture, virtually impossible. There are no party nominations still up for grabs. The, the uh, Libertarians have nominated their candidate. The Greens have nominated their candidate. By the way, it's just my own personal view. The Presidential Commission on Debates is not appointed by the president, is not a commission, and it is not about debate, it's about limiting debate. Personally, I think the Green Party candidate and the Libertarian Party candidate, if they are on enough ballots to theoretically reach 270 votes, they should be allowed in the debates. Not some phony measure in the polls in which they say, oh, you have to have 15%, because let me tell you how that works. When you get the 15, they change it to 20. Yeah. because the two parties aren't interested in any other voices. Frankly, I think Jill Stein will pull a lot of Bernie voters from Hillary. Let the woman speak. <laughs> Great. I'd be happy to uh, sign books, uh, take a few more pictures, but I want to thank you all for this.
terrific uh, turnout, and I apologize for being late.